Allen said, we do hope to see you all here for the conference uh, starting Wednesday night. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, Friday. I mean, those of you that usually don't come Wednesday night because it's just me, now you've got a reason to come um, on Wednesday night because it's somebody actually worth listening to. So we hope that you'll come here, Dan, all three evenings. And then um, Saturday morning, two services in the morning, two in the afternoon at Liberty. And we'll be, um, Gail and I'll be teaching and Dan on Saturday with lunch in between. And then um, on Sunday, uh, uh, Dave Greenwood and Dan will be speaking then of course with the picnic lunch to follow so um, we hope to see you there and it's always always a good time to get together with the Saints at Liberty and uh, this year we're doing a little different so we kind of split the give Dan more opportunity to speak and split the responsibility at the two, two churches so we hope that you'll be here and be a part of it and um, get to see Dan and Jean and uh, Jean already sent her text to me asking what flavor of Kringles she should bring. So, um, so she's you know those of you that know what Kringles are, she brings them every time. So, I, I mean, and she brings, and they're not cheap, and she brings like a whole trunk load of them. So I, don't, hmm, they must save up all year just to buy those Kringles. So, I think they have, I think they have an account at the Kringle place. So, Tracy, I said uh, last week when I was down teaching at Dave. Try to make yourself welcome. There's a couple now from Pittsburgh who's driving to Liberty every Sunday morning. Uh, from so Pittsburgh? Yes. Um, wow. They must be a lot better than me. So it's a really nice, a really nice couple. So make yourself, you know, introduce yourself to them when uh, you get there. I'm sure Dave will. Do you know who they are or how they heard about them? Oh, I forgot their names. Well, I think it was. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That does us a lot of good. Hey, who's here from Pittsburgh this morning? They will know who they are. <laughs> okay. Uh, very nice couple. Uh, I was talking to some other people and they said they would like to meet you. So they were out in the hall. So I talked to them and they love the grace message. I don't know. They, it must have been online or something. That and then they, they after they, and now they're never coming back. Because I was Because they met oh, you. Cause, yeah. So... <laughs> Well, that's that's quite a drive from. Well, I mean, you, you come out the turnpike. I mean, it's not, I guess, but still. Well, they, they said to me, you know, I don't know how much, but they said they'd be there that weekend of the good. conference. So, good, good, good. Uh, All right, I sounds think good. Wonderful. Yeah, Somebody yeah. Driving that far. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Um, also, on Wednesday nights, we've been mentioning about Trevor. Um, Barry Judy's son, Trevor Myers. Um, he did have his bone marrow transplant on the second. Um, which was Tuesday? Was that Wednesday? Wednesday. So he had it on the second. He's pretty sick um, right now. At, you know, right after the procedure, I guess you're because they they kill all your existing bone marrow, which takes away all your immunity to everything. Then they transplant, which in this case was his sister's bone marrow, into him, and then they have to wait and see if that new bone marrow actually takes over and starts to grow and replace the old bone marrow. So, um, so and we've been talking about it Wednesday nights and it finally happened this week was the, the bone marrow transplant. So it's, it's been done and it's just a waiting game now to see, see what, yeah, what happens with it. I don't know. I don't know. I was, I, I, I don't, I was trying to think up an intelligent sounding answer, but the only one I can come up with is I don't know. So. She, she had, at one time she had said she wished that she could be there. Okay. Well, I know Doc and Julie said that, ba that, that Barry has been going out a little bit more than he did before. So he does go out more, but he's, he's always masked, and he even wears a mask in the hot tub. So I'm not sure what the point of that is, but he wears a mask in the hot tub. And you should, if you, if you didn't see it this morning, you need to look. No, we'll turn it off. There's nothing to, I haven't said anything yet. So, not that I'm going to when I start preaching, but um, you got to look at the comic on your bulletin this morning. Okay. Because that, that comic's on your bulletin because I heard this report this week on the news of some Canadian, the health minister or whatever in Canada said, you should always wear a mask when you're having sex. So I was like, okay, uh, now, I, now I know. So, um, and, that, and that comic is about that. It's about a man and a woman with a mask on kissing each other. So, okay. There you go. So Before that's. Before I forget, I mentioned something. I have two granddaughters. No, you shouldn't comment on what I just commented about because no, that's enough said about that. So. That have COVID. Abby. Who really? Abby has COVID. Wow. She took her husband Jeff down to Myrtle Beach to 
see his best friend he hadn't seen, and she must have picked it up there. Okay. I haven't been around her since, so I'm fine. And then uh, uh, Dennis, my oldest son, Brittany, his granddaughter, uh, my, yeah, my his son, or his daughter, daughter, yeah. And she has it. Wow. So okay. They have two granddaughters. They're both doing all right, though? I mean, they're. Abby, I talked to her yesterday, I told them, she said, it's just like I have this heaviness in the chest. Yeah. It's really hard to breathe, she yeah. said. Yeah. And I'm only supposed to go back to the hospital if it gets to the point that I feel I can't breathe. Yeah, yeah. So she's yeah. just isolated from Jeff and her. Right. Uh, yeah, young people are pretty, you know, they're And tough. he's not allowed to go back to work until he checks out. Jeff, yeah, so yeah. Has, okay. So, yeah. Good. All right. Thank well, thanks for the update. So. Yeah, everybody knows Abby. So. Yeah, yeah. All right, Matthew chapter 13. Now you can start, Rhonda. It's too late. It's been well, don't you know how to hit off? <laughs> yeah, and then start? 30 seconds to clear itself. Well, Just breathe. All right, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. Great multitudes were gathered together unto him. So that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Let's bow our hearts down a word of prayer. Our God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking at your word and studying together this morning. As we do so, we pray that the things said and done would honor and glorify the name of Christ and edify the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. All right, this morning we want to continue um, and, and kind of wrap up this little series of studies on the parables. We've been talking about the parables which kind of led us into a brief discussion on the end times and is going to be brief because today's the end of it um, and if you have any questions about the end times that I didn't satisfy you with when Dan's here you can ask him because he knows all about it um, so we've been talking about the parables and what they represent and they they talk about and deal with that time between the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow a time between the cross and the kingdom, uh, which in prophecy, the prophets could see those two things, the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow, but they didn't see the detail of how you get from one to the other. And the parables are helping to fill in that detail of how you get from the sufferings of Christ to the glory that should follow. That time period, or part of that time period at least, um, is a time of tribulation. Um, as we saw last week, there really is no terminology in Scripture of the tribulation, um, which is the way most people look at it, meaning the tribulation, a period of time. Tribulation, rather, in Scripture is a, is a function of condition. Someone is in tribulation, or in tribu tr uh, trying... Uh, perilous times they are in, in tribulation but it's not a period of time a, a time period it's rather conditions during a certain time there are three three things in scripture three kinds of tribulation that are described in scripture and we're not going to look up the verses for all these this morning but just sort of review them briefly one is tribulation that is caused by uh, a sin cursed world and tribulation that is caused by a sin-cursed world is what we go through every day. Uh, it is tribulation, uh, sickness, disease, hunger, pestilence, um, COVID, anything like that. That's the tribulation of this life. The tribulation because we live in a sin-cursed world. Now part of this tribulation also is that a sin-cursed world, the world we live in, in general hates the cause of Christ. So at times there will be specific persecution that's a part of this tribulation caused by a sin cursed world. If you go to Acts chapter 14, uh, well yeah turn over to Acts chapter 14 then we're going to go through the other two kinds and then we'll we'll look at this passage in Acts chapter 14. But you can be getting heading toward Acts 14 now as, as I talk. Um, Acts chapter 14. The second kind of tribulation, and I think I did these in different order before, but this is the order we need to do them in for today. The second kind of tribulation is tribulation that is, is God's wrath on Israel. Um, in the 70th week. Actually, it could be God's wrath on Israel anytime, but specifically, God's wrath on Israel uh, in the 70th week of Daniel is what we're going to talk about today. Um, and that, that, chase, that wrath is chastening wrath. It's chastening, it's for the purpose of 
reforming Israel. It's for the purpose of calling them to repentance. It's, it's what you should be doing with children, chasing them. It's not punitive. It's not just to inflict pain or inflict punishment, but rather it's to correct them. The synonym of the word chastening in Scripture is correction. Um, when, when, the, the, when Paul says, um, uh, the scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That word correction has the idea of chastening. What chastens us today, corrects us, keeps us walking in the proper way, is the scripture. It's not God's intervention, it's the scripture that corrects our actions today. So that's the second thing, and all of these things in, in the scriptures are referred to by the term tribulation. The trials of this life are tribulation. God's wrath on Israel is Israel. Israel. There we go. Israel um, in the 70th week is tribulation. And this is what people commonly call the tribulation, which is not really correct terminology. And then three, there is God's wrath on the on unbelievers. And God's wrath on unbelievers is different than his wrath on Israel, number one, because it's poured out on all men without distinction, Jew and Gentile. And number two, it is punitive in its nature. It is not for the purpose of correcting. It is not for the purpose of trying to get men to change their minds. It is, the book of Revelation describes it as the wrath of God poured out without mixture from the cup of his indignation. So it's just it's just 100%. There's no mercy. There's no grace. There's nothing. It's the wrath of God poured out without mixture. It's not mixed with mercy from the cup of his indignation. And his indignation is his, his indignation and his hatred of sin. So all of these things in scripture are, are, are described with the term tribulation. So when you say tribulation, you need to be careful to define what you mean by that. Um, tribulation, so, so what we want to talk about in this study today and get through this and, and be done with the end times for a while again until other questions come up, is should you fear tribulation? Um, because one of the the reasons that people have for the way they view the end times. And one of the reasons that the traditional dispensational view has come about for the end times is, well, we cannot be a part of tribulation. We cannot be a part of wrath. We cannot be a part of all of that because God has saved us from the wrath to come. And we are not appointed to wrath. And all that's certainly true and we'll, we'll touch on that as we get to the end of the message today. But when you look out to that end time and what people tend to do, there are these three kinds of tribulation. All of them become more intense. Well, this first one becomes more intense and the other two come into play as we reach those end times. And the closer you get to the end time, the more intense that first one becomes. Um, you know, and, and at times I've tried to you know, talk to people about this and, and I've had people say, no, wrath is wrath. There's no... Th Wrath is wrath. Don't want to talk about it. That's it. Wrath is wrath. And there's wrath out at the end times. So wrath is wrath. And we can't be a part of any of that. But there's nothing else in scripture that we here view that way and just say, well, it is what it is. We shouldn't study it any further. When you look at wrath and when you study tribulation, it's very detailed and very specific in scripture what tribulation is and who it's being applied to and the reason it's being applied. The passage here in Acts chapter 14 verse 22 when Paul goes back uh, and he's confirming the, the, the souls in the churches after his first apostolic journey. Verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. So Paul says that we as believers in the dispensation of grace are going to suffer much tribulation. Hello? And somebody beating on the wall over there or something. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tribulation. Um, so we must, uh, through much tribulation, enter in the kingdom of God. Now that word that Paul uses there, is it, is it God's wrath on unbelievers? 
Is God's pouring out his wrath on unbelievers today? He is not. Is it God's wrath on Israel to chasten them? Obviously it's not. It is this one. It's, it's the result of living in a sin-cursed world, including, and in Paul's case here, what he's referring to specifically, being persecuted for his faith. Paul just got done telling us, verse, or Luke did, uh, verse 19, there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. Now that's some heavy duty persecution right there and that's heavy duty tribulation and that's because Paul lived in a sin cursed world and that sin cursed world hates Christ, hates his people, hates the cause of Christ and maybe we don't experience that a lot today directly that kind of persecution but it certainly exists in the world today. You know, Earl tells us every Wednesday night about the, the pastors he's in contact with in Cameroon and other places in Africa and the persecution that they endure so it certainly exists in the world today and we all in this world suffer the persecution or I'm sorry the tribulation that comes just as a result of sickness and disease and problems and trials and difficulties and all of that so do you have any promise that you are not going to go through this kind of tribulation the first one no. you have no promise you're not going to go through that ever Nowhere in Paul's epistles does he say, you're not going to go through. In fact, in this verse, as he's establishing local churches, he says just the opposite. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So, so this tribulation you are going to experience, period, that's it. That's the way it is. Now, go back to Daniel chapter 11. We were in Daniel 11 last week, and we came through Daniel 11 and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it today because we don't have a lot of time but we started in Daniel 11 verse 1 and as you come down through Daniel uh, 11 he's kind of talking about the time leading up to the 70th week you know 70 weeks are determined on my people and we'll read that verse in a few minutes here and, and, and Daniel 11 talks about the time leading up to that now some people will say well you know Daniel really is describing some things that happened you know, he's describing the, the the Roman Empire and 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 what happened you know after that and 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 that's possible that some of that is true but it also is something that's going to happen in the future because when prophecy speaks of something it has a meaning right now when when Isaiah it talks about the Assyrian. Who's he talking about? The Is he? Oh, you mean the first time? What, the, so you, get, well, the, you mean the first time. So when Isaiah talks about the Assyrian, who's he talking about? He's talking about the Assyrian, the king of Assyria. But he's also talking about the Antichrist in the future. When he talks about Nebuchadnezzar, thou art that head of gold. He's talking about Nebuchadnezzar, but he's also talking about the Antichrist. When he talks about Daniel, when Daniel talks about all these things in Daniel 11, he may be talking about historical things that are going to happen that for us are historical, but they're also prophetic for us in the sense that they are the future leading up to. And 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 Daniel 11 talks about all the things that happen leading up to the 70th week. Um, we know, we saw last week, verse 6, and in the end of years shall they join themselves together. In verse 8, he shall also carry captives into Egypt their gods with their uh, princes and with their precious uh, vessels of silver and gold and shall continue more years than the kingdom of the north. Verse 13, For the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. Three, three times, three verses in that passage, he talks about years. So between the end of the 69th week, which is the cross when Messiah is cut off, and the beginning of the 70th week, which is in the covenant is signed with death and hell, between that time, we know there's a period of years. Three times he says years. Don't know exactly how long it is. Not sure it's determined. You know, God determined exactly how long it's going to be. But some things are going to happen. And then, at the end of those years, verse 21, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give, or shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in 
peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overthrown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. He shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Yea, he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. So this is the rise of Antichrist. He, he in his estate shall stand up a vile person. So we're, we're in that time between the 69th and 70th week and the beginning of the 70th week. Keep your hand right here and flip back to chapter 9 of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build, the Jerusalem, to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. So there's seven weeks, three score and two weeks, so there's 62, and seven is 69. After three score and two weeks, verse 26, shall Messiah be cut off. He's cut off from out of the land of the living. That's the crucifixion. He's cut off, but not for himself. I mean, he doesn't do it. Someone does that. They crucify him. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end thereof shall be with a flood, and under the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm, he, that's the prince that shall come, will confirm the covenant with many for one week. So the way you know the beginning of the 70th week is the signing of that covenant. When the covenant is signed, the 70th week begins. 69th week ends at the cross, there's years in between, and then boom, the 70th week when the covenant is signed. Um, and just so we have it while we're here, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the cons consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. He'll confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the middle of that week, after three and a half years, he causes the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Paul calls it the, or, I'm sorry, um, Christ calls it the abomination of desolation. Um, so he makes the temple desolate. He's allowed temple worship. Uh, that's part of the covenant that he signs with Israel. And in the middle of that covenant, in the middle of that week, he says, that's it, we're done. Um, so that all ties in with Daniel 11, the rise of Antichrist, and that covenant. Keep your hand here in Daniel 11. Uh, go back to Isaiah chapter 28 for a minute. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28 talks about this covenant. Isaiah 28 verse 14. Wherefore... Isaiah 28, verse 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. Uh, and and uh, when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come up unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. So they, they're saying, you know, we, we've made this covenant with death and hell. And when the scourge comes, when, when, when the battle comes, we'll be okay because we've made lies our refuge and under falsehood we hid ourselves. Now, of course, they don't see it that way. This is God's perspective. You've made a covenant with death. They don't think they're make, making a covenant with death and hell, but they are. They don't think they're making lies their, their, their cover, uh, but they are. And you get down to verse uh, uh, 18. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then shall ye be trodden down by it. So God says, that covenant that you made with death, I'm going to disannul it. And the agreement you made with hell, 
it shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge, when I come in my wrath, guess what? You shall be trodden down by it. So Israel makes this covenant with death and hell, thinking they're saving themselves from the scourge that is to come. God says, no, 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 no. I'm going to wipe out that covenant that you made, and I'm still going to pour out my wrath. Now, that's all the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. When you get, go back to Daniel 11 now, get down to verse 36, and in verse 36, so we've got that, that covenant that is made, the first three and a half years, and then in verse 36 of Daniel 11, and the king shall do according to his will, and shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. Now, what is that what passage in Paul's epistles does that sound like? Second Thessalonians. So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, declaring himself that he is God. So that, Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 and 37, is what Paul talks about that comes uh, when the man of sin becomes the son of perdition, and we have the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, he, he stops that sacrifice, he stops that temple worship, and he, he marches into that temple and he says, I am your Messiah, worship me. And of course that's the breaking point for Israel, they, they got to decide. They're going to take his mark and worship him, or they're going to follow Christ that came. That's why if, if the spirit, any spirit that teaches not that Christ has come already in the flesh, that is 2,000 years ago, is not of God, but is Antichrist. So in, in Daniel 11, he, he's going through that time period. Um, and, and in that time period, then at the end of that time period, well, go to verse chapter 12, verse 1. So, so some things happen. He talks about the king of the south, the king of the north. Um, verse, um, well, start, uh, uh, well, verse 38. And in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Now remember, you know, years ago when, when you know, Star Wars came out, and, and who's God in Star Wars? The force. Let the force be with you. And, and, and what is Antichrist? He's the god of what? Forces. So it just, it's interesting. You know, let the force be with you. So I just, you know, I'm not saying that George Lucas was the Antichrist, but I'm just, you know, it's just, it's just interesting that, you know, man made a movie where the force is the controlling thing, and here you find the Antichrist is the god of forces, or, or his estate, he honors the God of forces. So, anyhow, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall honor, honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. And then it talks about some of the political things that are going to happen. Verse 40, at that time, at the time of the end, so we're getting real close to the end now, the king of the south shall put shit him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So he, he counterattacks the king of the south, the king of the north. Uh, he shall enter into the glorious land. He occupies the glorious land, the, the, the land that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and, and the land of Egypt uh, shall not escape, but he shall have power <coughs> over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore shall he go forth with great fury to destroy, and utterly to make away many. He shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall 
shall come to his end and none shall help him. So he's he's expanding, he's he's in fury, he's going to defeat even more nations, he's he's expanding his kingdom outside of the Middle East and, and the land that God gave to Abraham, he, he's, he's going to take the whole world. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, there shall be a time of trouble such as never since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn uh, many unto righteousness as stars forever and ever." But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So what happens? Well, there is this time that Daniel describes when the covenant is signed with death and hell. Isaiah and Daniel both describe it. That's the beginning of the 70th week. In the middle of that 70th week, the sacrifice and oblation cease, and the Antichrist turns against Israel. And God uses Uses, keep your hand here in Daniel 11. Go back to Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah 10 verse number 5. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation. And against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil, to take the prey, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. I'll take that Assyrian, I'll take that Antichrist, and bring him against a hypocritical nation. So, the, the question is this, in the middle of that week, great tribulation begins. Great trial, great difficulty, great problems. First of all, you've got all this stuff going on. You've got the... The, the nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, wars, rumors of wars, all the stuff Matthew talks about, all the stuff Daniel 11 talks about, all those terrible things are happening. Is any of that any different than what you might experience today? It's not. It, 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 it's, it's the same kind of thing that you go through today. And if you turn on the news tonight when you go home, you'll see it. Now, it, it gets more intense because the longer man goes, the worse he gets. Did you know that? That the longer man goes, the worse he gets? That's just a fact. So, you know, although we think the longer we go, the more refined we get, and the more understanding we get, and the more caring. No. The longer man goes, the worse he gets. And so, when you get to the end time, these tribulations caused by a sin-cursed world are on the upswing. And then in the middle of that week, he takes Antichrist, the Assyrian, and he says, I'm going to bring you against a hypocritical nation. Now, and I am going to use you to chasten my people Israel. Are you worried about being chastened with Israel? You, you shouldn't be. You really shouldn't be. Because are you Israel? Yeah. Mm -mm. Does God chase the members of the body of Christ directly? Yeah. With intervention? No. Should you worry? You know, we make a big deal. <clears throat> this verse says, I will send him against an hypocritical nation. Are you a nation? You're not a nation. We make a big deal over in Matthew where it says, the kingdom will be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And we make a big deal and say, oh, that can't be the Gentiles because it's, and it can't be the body of Christ because it's a nation. But then we read that and say, oh, the, the, the that time of tribute, it's going to be terrible and, and, and the whole world is going to be engulfed in it. Well, is the whole world a hypocritical nation? No. It's not. I will bring you, I will bring that Assyrian, Daniel chapter 11, I will bring that Assyrian against an hypocritical nation. Against, hear what he says, against 
the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil, to take the prey. And you know, he says, I give him a charge to take the spoil, to take the prey. If you go back to Daniel chapter 11 uh, and verse 24, <clears throat> He shall enter peaceably even unto the fattest places of the province. Daniel eleven twenty four. He shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his fathers' fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. I, and then he's going to come in and take the spoil and take the prey. First he scatters among them the riches and the prey and the spoil from all these nations he's defeated when he makes this covenant with them but then what's he do when he when he comes against them he takes the spoil and he takes the prey and he takes the riches that they had as in league with him but all that's about who Israel, Israel if you go um, ahead just a, a, a book to Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse um, 7 I will not read all the, the the, the verses leading up to it, but verse 7, well, verse 6, Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with a child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Who in here is Jacob? None of you are Jacob. None of you are Israel. It's a time of Jacob's trouble, and he shall be, but, uh, uh, but he shall be saved out of it. He will be delivered, but, but it's a time of Jacob's trouble. He'll be delivered out of it. And if you look at um, chapter 12, verse 1 of Daniel, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince was standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as was never since there was a nation to that time. <coughs> and at that time thy people shall be, what? Delivered. Delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. So there is this time, the second half of the 70th week, when when Israel, when wrath is poured out on Israel to chasten them. That's this second time, second way that the word tribulation is used in scripture. Are you worried about that happening to you? If you were, it, it, and, and you know, we talk about the timing of all this ad nauseum, but if, if God says, I'm going to chasten Israel with the Antichrist, is that is that God's wrath on you? Yeah. It's not. It's not. Now, then at the end, he's going to deliver. So how does he deliver? Well, let's go back to the book of Isaiah once again. Isaiah chapter 26. He's going to deliver at the end. <coughs> In Isaiah 26, Isaiah talks about that. Verse 16, Lord, in trouble they have visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. That's this, the chastening. Then after the, ch verse 20, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. The Lord cometh out of his place. This is after the indignation is overpassed, after the chastening. The Lord cometh to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Which one of these is that? Three. It's three. It's the last one. When the Lord comes to punish the earth for her iniquity. Back a few chapters into Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6. How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand? It cometh as a destruction from the Almighty. Here it is. Verse 7. Therefore shall, shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. Remember that. 
and they shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. The day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. The stars of heaven shall, and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth. The moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. Which, which is that? Which? It's the third one. And that third one is called uh, pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. That's the way it's described when the Lord returns and pours out his wrath on the world. But what happens then? Go to Matthew 20, get Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4. Matthew 24, <coughs> verse um, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So this is after the 70th week, at the end of the 70th week. The sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So, as a part of this last one, this third one, he gathers together his elect. Then, down to verse 48, But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So after he gathers out his elect, what happens to everybody else? They'll be damned. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The, the, uh, you don't think in the day he's coming as a thief in the night and if you're not a faithful servant and you don't know that verse 42 says watch therefore for you know not what hour the Lord cometh I want you to remember that what's the instruction of God to Israel watch, watch therefore because he's coming as a thief in the night you need to watch because if you're not ready he'll get you unawares Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. How does Paul describe the end time? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says this, <clears throat> beginning uh, in verse... Uh, whoops, whoops, yeah, yeah, verse 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning that which are asleep, that ye sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. So, he gathers out his elect. Verse 5. But at the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. Hmm. Where do we read that? Mm -mm, not Matthew. Isaiah, Isaiah 13. The day of the Lord is destruction that comes as a woman that, that is with child. Paul says that destruction that's coming, that's the destruction of the day of the Lord. That's the destruction at his return. Ye, brethren, verse 4 of chapter 5, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, the children of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be what? Sober. You remember what, you remember what Christ said in Matthew chapter 24? 
Um, he, Paul says, watch and be sober. Christ says, verse 42, watch therefore. He says in verse 49, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. Hmm. Would that be the opposite of being sober? Yeah. Probably. The, the warning that Christ gives is, is almost identical to the warning that, that Paul gives. And then he says, verse 7 of chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, 7, They that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. What wrath, excuse me, what wrath is it that we're not appointed to? God's wrath, but which the third one we're not appointed to that wrath this one we all get every day the second one is Israel so that's not us this in this context Paul is saying you're when when God returns when Christ returns are you part of the people that get the wrath or part of the people that get delivered get delivered no wrath on uh, God hath not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ but that wrath he's not talking about this certainly because we go through that every day and Paul tells us we're going to go through that every day he's not talking about this because that's Israel and we don't get that wrath it's got nothing to do with us he is talking about this that the wrath at the return of Christ, when he, he, he destroys the sinners out of the land and he punishes the evil for their iniquity, we're not appointed to that. Now, when does that come, that wrath? Yes. Clear at the end, at the day of the Lord, the end of the 70th week. So. You can talk all you want about the timing, and it's fine. I don't care when you think we're getting out, that's fine. But what I know for sure is that you can't say, well, we, we have to be out at, 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 at this time, you know, before the 70th week or in the middle of the 70th week or any of that stuff, because we're not appointed to wrath. Because the wrath you're not appointed to is this one. And that one comes clear at the end, and Paul specifically tells us in his description of the end that you're going to be gathered out and caught away, and then this wrath comes on the earth. And you don't need to, you don't need to worry about that because you're not appointed to wrath. But these other two, that's got nothing to do with it. What Paul's telling you in this passage he's saving you from is the wrath at the return of Christ. The day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And that wrath is not for you. You get deliverance. But you can't use that to say, well, therefore, you know, well, wrath is wrath and anything out there is... No, 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 no. There's all this stuff going on at the end time. And the one we're delivered from is this. When Paul says we're delivered from... You don't need delivered from God's wrath on Israel. Why not? You're not Israel. You don't need delivered from it. He never promised deliverance from this, from the sin-cursed world. But he did promise, I'll never pour out my wrath on you. You'll never taste of my wrath. And that's when we're caught away at the end. And Israel is gathered out at the end. Let's bow our hearts down in a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that we do have the promise of being delivered from the wrath to come. And that in Christ we are safe and secure. In his name we pray. Amen.